Well, thank you for the introduction and the invitation to uh, speak today. And uh, thanks to all of you, because I think I'm probably all that's standing between you and your entertainment on Friday evening. And just to tantalise us, we can see the bar from out the window. So, so thanks very much for that. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about teaching specifically, and a bit about what kind of rethinking I think needs to go on in economics. But the first thing I want to say is that economics is great. It's a very powerful social science. There's been lots of scientific progress over the last 20 years or so, um, which I wrote about in one of my books called The Soulful Science. But having said that, and not wanting to throw away all that we get out of economics, um, the crisis, I think, has made a lot of economists reflect on what the mainstream of the subject is and how that changes, and in particular, how it's transmitted to new generations of economists through, through teaching and what gets taught in universities. And I think, and a lot of people think, there are some problems with what has become the mainstream that's taught to cohort after cohort of student. Um, so rethinking is, is the right word, not chucking away everything that we know, um, but thinking about how to move the mainstream towards some of the really useful work that's gone on in the past 20 years, and reflecting on the role of economists in society over the last generation or two as well. About 18 months ago, I had a series of conversations with some academics I know. I don't teach, I, I'm a practice, practicing economist. Um, but with some academics, with some other employers of econ graduate economists as well. And all those conversations with different people turned out to be roughly the same. And the phrases people used were, the young economists are too narrow, um, they, they don't know enough about the real world. And it's that, that phrase, too narrow, kept cropping up all the time. And I thought, well, maybe there's a coordination problem. If academics want to teach something different, and employers want graduates who've got different kinds of skills or knowledge or competences, then the thing to do is get them together and talk to each other. So I organised a conference that was hosted by the Bank of England and the Government Economic Service. And um, we, had, we had a sell-out session, and um, the book of essays, What's the Use of Economics, gathered some essays that were written beforehand by overseas people and the presentations that were given at the conference. So I'll come back in a little bit to talk about how that process of curriculum reform has continued. Um, the other interesting thing to note is that there are a lot of student movements as well. Obviously there's this initiative. There have been big student movements in Chile, in, in Turkey, uh, in France. There was a one-day walkout at Harvard famously from Greg, Greg Mankiw's course. So there's, there's student pressure too. So I think this is a moment when things will change if we get organised and, and, and talk about it. But I want to start, well no, before, before that, um, out of that conference at the Bank of England, a really remarkable consensus emerged from a whole range of economists. The Government Economic Service, biggest recruiter of economists in this country, um, people who work in investment banks and hire people to do the kind of client research and, and the financial stuff. Um, people who, who run consultancies. So across the spectrum of employers, the themes about what they would rather see in graduate economists were really consistent. And some of them were about competencies. Um, communication came up. If you work as an economist, unless you're an academic, <coughs> intrinsic to your job is communicating your technical knowledge to people who are not specialists, whether it's politicians in public policy or uh, businesses or clients and investment banks, that communication skill. Another was um, practical data handling and the feeling that a lot of what's taught in econometrics is um, too theoretical and what do students know when they face a real data set and it's messy and it's got outliers and there's errors in there. So practical data skills was another one. But some of it was about the content as well and particularly striking an emphasis on both um, economic history, the events in the economy, but the history of economic thought, how economists have thought about those events. And the, the sense was really strong that new graduates don't have that kind of context about that the sort of meta-understanding of economics, how economists have thought about the economy over time, and the way that problems crop up over and over again. And it's a very cyclical world. So um, having in, set all that out, I want to spend some time talking about what needs rethinking. 
And the key strength of economics is that we use models in a way that other social scientists don't. And models, if they work well, are really powerful. It's a really good analytical way of taking a really complex problem and boiling it down to the things that matter most. Now, here's an example of a good model. It's the London Underground map, of course. And it's not perfect. If you want to go from the 260 metres from Leicester Square to Covent Garden, going by tube is not a good way to do it. If you want to travel from Wimbledon to South Wimbledon, this would be a really bad guide because it would send you all the way into town and back out again. So it's not perfect, but it's actually a very good model. It strikes a good balance between simplifying something complicated because you wouldn't want these lines overlaid on an actual map of London and um, not, not, being, not, being too uh, not being too simplistic. So it's neither too simple nor too complicated. It's a really good model. There are not all that many economic models that live up to that standard. And part of the trouble is that, first of all, the economy is very, very complicated, so it's easy to oversimplify. And secondly, economists love models so much that they forget about the reality to which they were attached. And uh, John Kay wrote a, a great essay last year with the title, The Map is Not the Territory. And the mistake that a lot of economists make is to think that once you've got the map, you can ignore the things that go on around it, all the complexities. So I think one of the big problems is being um, diverted by the power of models and concentrating on them too much and losing touch with reality. And one example I want to give you of that is game theory, which is a fantastic tool in economics. And as you all know, it's been used to incredible effect in real world situations. You could argue that it was game theory that won the West, the Cold War, the, the whole Dr. Strangelove business. Um, game theory famously was used to auction off 3G telecoms licenses and raise 22 billion pounds for the government a number of years ago. So it's a great practical tool. But Ariel Rubenstein, who's a game theorist, has people play games in his lectures on his website when he gives talks to members of the public. And he's done more than 13,000 of them and um, looked at what kind of results he gets out of the games that people actually play in those contexts. And we know when we're taught game theory that um, the Nash equilibrium is the point where you decide what's best for you on the assumption that everybody else playing the game is going to do what's best for them. The trouble is when you play it in real life, not many people pick the Nash equilibrium. It's a real minority. And quite a lot of people will pick um, a solution that shows, them, uh, shows no sign of strategic thinking at all. They just haven't thought about what anybody else playing the game will do. And even more, have thought strategically, they've thought about what reaction they'll get from other people, but they've done the sums wrong, and they come out with the wrong answer. Now that's really interesting, because it means that if you're a rational person playing a game, you ought to be assuming that the other people are stupid if you're rational. So the rational solution is actually irrational. There's a real paradox in there, in the way that games are actually played. And if you want to read more about it, he wrote a terrific book called Economic Fables, which is really um, readable and, and touches on some of these quite interesting philosophical issues about economics. The trouble is there's an ambiguity in the word rational. This is what economists mean. <coughs> rational is somebody who thinks like Mr. Spock in a completely uh, logical way, making good calculations. I'm old, so this is the old generation Mr. Spock, not the new generation Mr. Spock. But what a lot of normal people mean is reasonable or understandable. And if Captain Kirk falls in love with an alien and does something impulsive to go and rescue her on the surface of the planet, that's perfectly rational to a lot of people. So there's actually a, a disjunction between economist usage and normal usage of the word. Now we know now because of behavioural economics that um, people don't naturally think logically. It's cognitively unnatural to do that. Daniel Kahneman has this phrase, uh, the, this, these terms, fast thinking and slow thinking. And slow thinking is the logical, calculating kind. It's very energy intensive. It uses a lot of, uh, of chemical energy in the brain. And it's hard to do. We find it very difficult. And it has to be learned. So what we mostly do is the fast thinking, the, uh, the rule of thumb kind, the heuristics. 
and a psychologist identified a lot of frequent departures from the economist version of rational thinking. So things like um, uh, the risk aversion, the framing effects, the uh, prospect theory, and so on. And we've made a lot of progress in economics in um, understanding those, incorporating them in some models, although not in basic consumer choice theory. It's one of the complaints employers had, actually, that new graduates, new graduates are not taught in their undergraduate course enough behavioural economics because policymakers are absolutely desperate to understand what implications this has for regulation and policy making. So there's the behavioural economics. We've also made real progress in economics in using new techniques, um, the randomised control trials, the field experiments, new econometric techniques, to get a better understanding. And the phrase for this in policy circles now is what works. The government's actually funding some research centres that are called what works centres, which does make you wonder what they thought they were doing before they had <laughs> what works centres. Anyway, that's, that's an improvement. The trouble with economists using the new behavioural findings, using the new techniques like randomised control trials, is that there's still a reductiveness. We still want to make it very simple. It's actually quite hard to establish causality, even in a trial, because you not only have to establish it in the context in which you're doing the test and make sure that you've selected the control group and, and the trial group properly, and that you've not told them about it, because they, if they know they're in a trial, that will change their behaviour anyway and bias the results. You then also have to make sure that you understand enough about the context to carry over the results into a different context. So they're not a silver bullet either. But there's a great demand for economists to give simple answers. It's, um, as I've been saying, something we like to do ourselves, a bit prone to ourselves, but also policymakers want simple answers. And I came across this great example on a blog by uh, Duncan Green at Oxfam. This is a map of how to think about the situation in Afghanistan when the invasion first started. Somebody worked out what all the variables were and how they related to each other. <laughs> you can see it's really complicated. But this is what it means to say the economy is a, 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 a complex nonlinear system. The trouble is, and um, he was talking about this in the context of um, development and, and aid funding, policymakers want to know that the aid is working. So they're not interested in the complexity. They want to know if we spent $10 billion on this, what impact has it had? and demonstrate to us um, what you've been doing and what the impact was and that we got value for money for it. And that's kind of understandable, but it means that there's a real temptation to ignore the complexity of the world and oversimplify. And we do this a lot in economics. The um, US government publishes something like 45,000 statistics on the US economy. And if you add in private sector data as well, there are about 4 million time series available for the US economy. And macroeconomic models have you know, a dozen, two dozen variables. So you're trying to explain two dozen variables with 4 million. And it's just intrinsically very difficult to work out any um, clear answers about causality or size of impacts in that context. And uh, Nate Silver, in his fantastic book about prediction, Signal in the Noise, um, talks about the way economists, and macroeconomists in particular, in doing their forecasts, fall victim to the temptation to overfit to their equations. It's the tyranny of looking for a high R squared or T squared or T statistics in your, in your regressions. It's the tyranny of wanting precise answers, even if they're inaccurate, rather than accurate but imprecise answers that you get from the real world data context. This is just a fundamental epistemological issue in economics. Um, so there's, there's that overfitting danger, the, the temptation to um, simplify thing, things, things so that you have clear explanations. A second, oops, sorry I have to try and go back. I'm looking backwards and doing this with my left hand, so bear with me. Um, another pitfall that people often fall into is not thinking about the counterfactual. 
This is really important in lots of areas of public policy, like competition policy, which I did for a few years. This is because there was a great example of ignoring the counterfactual in a Financial Times story a couple of weeks ago. Sennheiser manufactures these very expensive headphones. This pair costs about $300, I think. And they were launching a campaign against uh, pirated copies that were selling for $30 because they said it was going to be bad for the company's reputation. Probably true. But they claimed, they commissioned some research that claimed that this was costing them $2 million a year in lost sales. Now, this is not true. It's probably costing them almost zero in lost sales because people who pay $30 for a pair of headphones would not pay $300 if that pair were unavailable. So the people suffering are the other makers of cheap but authentic headphones. And Sennheiser's lo losing hardly any sales through this piracy, although they may be suffering a damage to their reputation. A lot of practical economics ignores the counterfactual. Or if they recognise that there is a counterfactual they need to compare things to, they compare it to the world of um, a perfectly competitive market where unicorns wander at the end of the garden. You know, you've got to compare it to the real world and what might actually happen. So the conclusion is that we just need to be much more modest about what economists can actually know and we need to collect a lot more data. And I think this is particularly true in macroeconomics. I get into trouble for slagging off macroeconomics, but I think it is really in trouble at the moment. We have these um, tournaments between opposing camps of macroeconomists. Ordinary members of the public find it very difficult to... It's punch and judy show. They don't know who's right. They're just hitting each other over the head, and they can't assess the arguments. And it sounds very empirical. They'll be talking about, you know, it's 0.9% GDP growth versus 0.5% or the multiplier is 1.3 or 1.5. The, the big controversy, of course, was a mistake in an Excel spreadsheet, so how much more empirical can you get than that? But the trouble is, they don't know anything, actually. They can't demonstrate anything because they don't pay enough attention to the other four million variables. They're always talking about the same ones all the time. The one exception that I know about, I've done it again, is Alan Greenspan. I really want to show you the picture of the underpants. There we go. Alan Greenspan's famous for looking at a lot of very detailed statistics of the economy, including in one interview, it turned out sales of men's underpants. Because the way you knew that the economy was in really bad shape was that even sales of men's underpants went down from their very low base to start with. So he found that a good indicator of a serious recession. <laughs> but he's an exception. Most macroeconomists focus on the same data all the time and have these sort of scholastic theological arguments about what it means. And they ought to be collecting a lot more data. Um, the, great, the key characteristic, it seems to me, of the UK economy at the moment is that there are two economies. There's a London and hinterland economy and there's a, a, the rest of the country economy. The, Characteristics of the populations are different, the socio-demographic ha characteristics, mm -hmm. the structure of industry is different, the baseline level and the distribution of income is different. So the impacts of monetary and fiscal policy are different in the two. And I don't know of any macroeconomic models of the UK that actually look at that. So where's the humility? There are a lot of calls after the crisis for more humility, and I, I just don't see it yet, and I particularly don't, don't see it in the rows about, about macro and forecasting. We have to remember as well that economics is a social science. It's got people in it. It's got people who react to things that policymakers do. And economists often forget about the reaction. This is an illustration from Alice in Wonderland and the croquet game. I don't know how many of you have read the book, but she starts playing croquet and the mallet turns out to be a flamingo who looks up and says, what are you doing? And the ball turns out to be a hedgehog who uncurls and walks away. This happens in economics. If you, if you um, want to evaluate policy, you have to think about what the reaction to the policy will be. People forget about the fact that this is a, a, a complex, dynamic system with nonlinear feedbacks, and it's got people in it who are reacting to all the things that are going on. So this is inherently unpredictable. You just don't know not only what all the feedbacks are and what the data is showing you, but you don't know how it's going to evolve over time because people will be responding to things that happen. Um, 
So what are the conclusions? One is that models are really important. I don't want economists to give up on models, but they're not everything. And one of the reasons I think employers are really interested, even if they're in investment banks, in people learning more economic history in university, is that that's part of the information outside the model that helps you understand what's in the model. It's part of that wisdom that you need to interpret models pop properly and not oversimplify the conclusions that you draw from them. The second is that, like Alice, economists need to take account of um, the evidence on people reacting and how they take those decisions, the behavioural psychology, we have to put that at centre stage of the mainstream and not have it just as an add-on to the mainstream. And that means actually rethinking quite a lot of consumer theory. <coughs> For me, it means not teaching people the formal proofs of, of um, utilitarian-based consumer theory and the existence of general equilibrium. We could ditch all of that. <coughs> it's not useful. But incorporate some of this in, instead, right at the fundamentals. And being much more careful and much more humble about empirical claims in economics. So I talked about the overfitting, I talked about ignoring the counterfactuals. There are tons of others. There's the omitted variables and the simultaneity in macroeconomic models. Um, there's also, finally, in this bit before I go back to the teaching, a moral question. There's a kind of um, really popular free economics school of economics now that derives from Gary Becker's work on the uh, economics of marriage and, and crime and so on, and treats all kinds of issues, all kinds of social issues, as if they were the same sort of choice as going shopping and making a decision about what to buy, or going into the labour market and making a decision about what kind of job you want. It treats them as just the same. And people who are not economists and not socialised into thinking the way that we think find that very bizarre. There was a, a great line in Scientific American recently that said, although this has method, there's madness in it. <laughs> Normal people find it very strange. Why they, they wonder why economists don't think more about, about social norms. And some do. Ed Glazer at Harvard has done a lot of work on the social norms that determine uh, crime waves or their retreat or um, obesity epidemics. There's a social phenomena as well as economic phenomena, and you can't do them only using the kind of Becker or free economics style of model. So there's, um, there's a sort of factual aspect to that. It's just ignoring evidence not to look at things like social norms or people's sense of identity and how that determines their choices. But there's a moral aspect to it too, because we think we're doing what's called positive science. Milton Friedman wrote a very famous essay <coughs> in the 60s sometime about the difference between positive a normative science, what is um, or what, what ought to be. And economics, he insisted, is about what is. And he said, the more you find out what is, the, the narrower the range of things that you need to argue about when, in terms of morality. You can sort of uh, determine the territory much more clearly for your moral arguments by doing this positive program of economics. So we think we're doing positive economics, but it really quickly slips over into the normative and ought. So here's an example. Never mind the example, I'll give you a different example. Um, I was going to compare Dan Brown with a serious book. But um, let's take movies. The film Argo won the Oscar for Best Movie this year, and there was something on the Free Economics blog that said, well, that's wrong because the Avengers took $200 million at the box office. And who are we to say that we know better than the people who went to watch the Avengers and it should have got the best Oscar? So there's this kind of segue from it's more popular as an empirical observation to it's better because it's more popular. And I don't think that's true. I think Albert Camus' novels are better than Dan Brown's novels. And I think some movies are better than others, whether or not they're more popular at the box office. And in fact, it's a kind of madness to say uh, your judgment about quality and, and, and moral judgments are only determined by the um, amount that people spend. Especially when through the behavioural economics programme, we know that people are stupid. They can't do the sums. So they're not making, they're not making their best judgments. 
behavioural economics is inherently paternalist. And I think that's probably a good thing, because if, it's, if it consumes our mental energy and physical energy to do the calculations and we get it wrong, so we're damaging our financial prospects by not saving enough for our pensions, and you can fix that by having opt-out rather than opt-in programmes for pension saving, then you should do that. That paternalism is a good thing. But you can't have paternalism in that corner of the territory and pretend to be doing only positive economics in another corner of the territory and at the same time be slipping judgments about morality in through the back door in that positive economics program. So I think thinking carefully about the ethical dimension of economics is really important when we're teaching it as well. So let me finally uh, get back to the teaching so we've got lots of time for discussion. And I'm going to put up, I have put up the ad for the book, so if any of you feel like reading the essays and that, that's, that's what it looks like. Um, the conference in early 2012 ended up, as I said earlier, with this quite strong consensus among employers and among the academics who'd selected themselves into it that it would be good to see some change in the undergraduate curriculum. And we started there because you've got to start somewhere. And people didn't want the momentum to dissipate, so we set up a working group afterwards that had the Treasury and the Bank of England and employers and the institutions of the economic profession in the UK, so the Royal Economic Society, the Economics Network, which looks at teaching and learning, and put out a statement that was a, a kind of consensus view about general areas of change that, that we would like to see. So it says that it's, that it's on... Um, the World Economic Society website, for example. And it does say things like, let's have more economic history in the curriculum, uh, let's have um, what we call more pluralism, and that meant introducing some different approaches, teaching behavioural economics in undergraduate programmes, for example, um, and not just sticking with the existing mainstream. The... Um, Efforts now going in two different directions. One is through all these institutions of higher education, and there's something called the QAA, the quality, one of the academics will know quality assessment something. Sure. That's it, quality assurance agency, and they set benchmarks for subjects that all universities have to adhere to. So they're now talking to employers to see whether they want to change their benchmarks. And do they, for example, <coughs> want to introduce anything about the competences that employers want to see about Data, practical data skills, communication skills, and so on. And that will take that takes a long time. That's quite a slow process. Separately, the Institute for New Economic Thinking is now funding some work on the development of actual modules of a new undergraduate curriculum. And this is cross-national. So I was at a meeting yesterday that had people from Turkey and Chile and India. And um, I think it will end up looking quite different to the current undergraduate curriculum. Now, that, that's not to say it will all change, because there are very strong incentives for people not to bother doing anything different. You will all know that people who teach in universities have a lot of pressures on their time. Things are set up to make it as easy as possible for them at the moment. They've already got their lecture notes, they've spent their careers already studying one particular way, so there's a real time investment involved in changing what you teach. On the other hand, you'll know better than me, but I think there's quite a lot of student interest in seeing some change. And in this country, we now have the fact that students are paying much higher fees that will give them a much greater voice, and quite right too, in what they're being taught. So I'm quite optimistic about how things might change, and, and perhaps that's something that we can discuss as well. Um, and the final thing I want to say is that we need... We don't have all the wisdom in the room ourselves. We need to get ideas from other people as well. Over the next couple of days, you're going to be having some more conversations about rethinking economics. And um, we will want to engage with people over the next months to be involved in looking at pilot material. We're going to want universities to volunteer to pilot a new course from September 2014. So I hope that through the Rethinking Economics website, some of you will want to stay in touch with that process. And any feedback you have outside the room today about what I've said in terms of the content and how we think about economics itself, or about the conversation we can have now about teaching it, um, will be really welcome. So I hope, I hope you'll do that. 
Um, but I want to stop now so that we can have a discussion 